Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting chemistry video. Today, our focus is going to be on determining different types of chemical reactions, and we can look at that based on whether things gain or lose electrons, whether things gain or lose hydrogen atoms, how those atoms are broke, how those bonds are broken, how those bonds are made. There's lots of different ways that we can go through and identify different types of chemical reactions based on how the reaction itself behaves. So that's what we're really going to dive into today. So hopefully by the end of this video, you will be able to describe different types of chemical reactions, including acid-base reactions, oxidation reduction reactions, and precipitation reactions. You should also be able to assign oxidation numbers to determine if a redox reaction takes place, identify an acid-base, conjugate acid, or conjugate base, explain the role of water in an acid-base reaction, analyze the strengths of acids and bases, and balance chemical equations for redox reactions from your half reaction. So if there are no further questions, let's get started. Now, in previous chemistry classes, we have identified chemical reactions into five basic categories. We had synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement, and the combustion of a hydrocarbon. A synthesis reaction is where two or more reactants combine to produce one compound. A decomposition is when a compound is broken down into two or more compounds or individual elements. Single displacement, element plus compound, an element replaces an element in the other compound. Double displacement, where two compounds produce two compounds. And combustion is burning of some carbon-hydrogen compound with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, for this class, we're going to classify reactions a little bit differently. So instead of classifying them like the five that we've talked about previously, we're now going to classify them into acid-base reactions, oxidation-reduction reactions, or precipitation reactions. So there's a lot of overlap between these different types of chemical reactions. So you may see you know, an acid-base reaction that's also a double displacement reaction, or you may see a, a oxidation reduction reaction that is also a combustion reaction. So you're gonna see a lot of overlap between the different types that we will talk about. So let's start off by talking about acid-base reactions. And acid-base reactions involve the transfer of one or more protons between the chemicals. We're gonna utilize what's known as the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acid base, at least for now, there are three definitions for acids and bases, but Bronsted-Lowry is what we're going to focus on, where acids are proton donors and bases are proton acceptors. So it's real easy to identify an acid-base reaction because an acid-base reaction just involves the transfer of a proton from the acid to the base. Now some acids, in particular weak acids and bases, react with water to produce ions which make either the solution acidic or make it basic. So you can see here a strong acid, HCl plus H2O. HCl is a strong acid. It completely dissociates when you put it into solution. So we're going to get a bunch of H plus from that. A weak acid, however, uh, doesn't dissociate completely. What it does is it reacts with water, and that reaction with the water removes the hydrogen. Uh, same concept with strong bases and weak bases. Although with strong bases, we're looking at OH, not H. And uh, we'll talk more about that in our acid base unit. The acid in your reactant side becomes your base, your conjugate base on the product side, and your base on your reactant side becomes your conjugate acid on the opposite side of the equation. So the strength of the conjugate acid or the strength of the conjugate base is based off of the original acid strength. If it is a strong acid, it will have a weak conjugate base, and if it is a weak base, it may have a strong conjugate acid. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. So let's go through here and identify the acid, the base, the conjugate acid, and the conjugate base of this reaction. So we have HCl and water, and the H in HCl is donated to the H2O to create H3O plus and chlorine. So we can say that HCl is the acid because it donates the hydrogen. It donates it to H2O, so H2O is accepting the hydrogen, so therefore H2O is acting as a base. The acid becomes the conjugate base, so HCl becomes Cl minus, so Cl minus is your conjugate base. And then your base, which is H2O, becomes your conjugate acid H3O plus. So as long as you know where the hydrogen is coming from and where it goes, you should be able to very easily identify acids, bases, conjugate acids, and conjugate bases. So let's talk a little bit about redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. These involve the transfer of electrons in a chemical reaction, and it's very identifiable by looking at changes in oxidation numbers. We'll go through the rules on identifying and figuring out oxidation numbers a little bit later on. But oxidation is the losing of electrons and reduction is the gaining of electrons. Now that seems a bit counterintuitive, reduction is gaining. But the easy way to remember that is oil rig. 
oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. So before we dive into that, let's figure out how we determine oxidation numbers. Here are some rules that you're going to want to remember in terms of discovering and finding oxidation numbers. All elements in their natural state have an oxidation number of zero. Group one, two, and three compounds are always plus one, plus two, plus three. Fluorine is always minus one. Hydrogen's usually plus one. It can be minus one in hydride compounds. Oxygen is usually minus two. The only real exception to that is a peroxide. And chlorine is usually minus one unless it starts a chemical compound. But if you know the usually rules and really consider them always rules, you probably will be fine. And then based on those numbers, we can utilize some concepts that we've talked about previously in nomenclature to be able to identify the oxidation numbers of things that aren't in this particular rule book. You'll see what I mean here in just a moment. So let's identify the species oxidized and reduced in the following chemical reaction. So let's take a look at CuO as an example. O is always a minus two, so Cu here is going to be a plus two. We notice that there's no charge on CuO, so the oxidation numbers have to balance out, just like what we would do when we were doing nomenclature and determining Roman numerals or determining what types of subscripts we're gonna put on there. Now again, oxygen, usually minus two, so the C is going to be a plus two. Copper is by itself in the product side, so its oxidation number is zero, and the carbon is now a plus four in my product side because I have oxygen. Oxygen's oxidation number is minus two. I have two of them, so my total negative charge here is negative four, so carbon's going to be a positive four. So based on that information, we can figure out what has changed. Oxygen in a compound is almost always minus two, so Cu has to be a plus two to balance the oxidation numbers. And the same can be said for carbon and carbon monoxide. Cu by itself is always zero, and the carbon in CO2 is a plus four since it bonded with two O's with a negative two charge. So let's think about what changed oxidation numbers. To summarize, copper goes from a two plus to a zero, and carbon goes from a two plus to a four plus. So we need to figure out based on that information which gained electrons and which lost electrons. Well, copper gained two electrons, because remember, electrons have a negative charge, and as a result, that changes the oxidation number from a positive two to zero. Car carbon, on the other hand, lost two electrons because it goes from a two plus oxidation state to a four plus oxidation state. So because copper gained electrons, we say that it is being reduced. Remember, oil rig reduction is gaining. Carbon lost two electrons, so because it lost, we say that carbon is oxidized in this reaction. So by going through and identifying the oxidation numbers of every single element in these compounds, identifying what changed as a result of the chemical reaction, we can easily figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. If something is being oxidized, something is also being reduced. So in the end, we would say that copper is reduced and carbon is oxidized. Now, something that's really important to be able to do is to write out half reactions with this. So what we do is we consider those electrons very much like we would consider a reactant or product. Copper gained two electrons, so I'll have copper with my plus two charge on the left side, and it gained two electrons, so because it gained them, we'll consider them a reactant, and those become solid copper at the very end. Now at the very bottom, we had copper that was a two plus charge. It lost those electrons, so we consider those part of the product, and as a result, we end up with carbon with an oxidation number of four plus. So we think about these things in terms of reactants and products, what's being gained, what's being lost, and you can very easily write out your half reactions for these equations. Now again, half reactions can be used to determine full and balanced chemical equations. So you would just combine these reactions together to get your full redox reaction. The only difference here that you need to make sure that you're aware of is that your electrons need to cancel. So what that means is that, for example, what's being reduced in the very top has three electrons that are being lost, and at the bottom is two. We need to figure out what is the lowest common multiple of those numbers, and then we can balance out our chemical equation. So I'm gonna multiply all of the top equation by two and the bottom equation by three, giving us six electrons in my reactant side of what's being reduced and six electrons in my product side of what's being oxidized. Similar chemicals on each side of an equation are going to cancel, and then what's going to be left behind is my full redox reaction. So again, just make sure that you're aware that you have to cancel out the electrons and may need to multiply chemical equations in order to make that happen. The last type of reaction I want to talk about is a precipitation reaction, and precipitation reactions result from the creation of insoluble or slightly soluble compounds. 
A couple things you may want to remember is that all sodium, potassium, ammonium, and nitrate compounds are always soluble in water. So if you ever have a choice between some compounds, those compounds are always going to be soluble, so those will always be aqueous. So what we want to look at is our net ionic equations. We want to look at just what changes state. So as we wrap up this video, it is very important to be able to identify the three different types of chemical reactions that have taken place today. Our acid-base reactions, which are a transfer of a proton, redox reactions, which are a transfer of electrons, and precipitation reactions, which create some type of insoluble compound that would be solid in an otherwise aqueous solution. So make sure you're able to fully identify those types of reactions. So hopefully, again, you're able to identify those different types of reactions, assign oxidation numbers, identify acids, bases, conjugate acids, conjugate bases, understand the role of water in an acid-base reaction, analyze the strengths of acid bases and their conjugates, and balance redox reactions from half reactions. So again, just a brief overview of what we're going to be covering. Hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you guys very, very soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.